Welcome to Design Talks Now, hosted by Design Pavilion in support of New York City's international design community. I'm Eileen Shaw, producer of Design Pavilion and Design Talks. Our mission is to increase public awareness and the perception of value of design thinking, services, and projects. Design Talks Now is, of course, our virtual response to the COVID shutdown. And as the world slowly opens again in phases, we know attitudes have drastically changed in irreversible ways. But really, will society, countries, and cities support the necessary change to our man-made world? As we have seen the air and waterways unpollute so quickly during this pause, this is our time to seize the moment and influence lasting change. And so we're asking you to share your observations, courageous thoughts and ideas during this extraordinary time. And we're documenting these rich conversations and the vision. Today's talk, Designing Against Extinction, features leaders in ecological design and urbanism as they question what the future would be if biology and architecture became one. I'm very pleased to introduce PhD urban designer, architect, and TED fellow, Mitchell Joachim, co-founder of Terraform One and an associate professor of practice at NYU. Mitchell was once an architect at the offices of Frank Geary and I.M. Pei. He's been awarded a Fulbright scholarship and fellowships with Moshe Safdie and Martin Society for Sustainability of MIT. He was chosen by Wired Magazine for the Smart List and selected by Rolling Stone for the 100 People Who Are Changing America and awarded by Time Magazine for Best Invention with MIT Smart Cities Car. Mitchell has co-authored three books and won countless honors and awards. His design work has been exhibited at MoMA, the Venice Biennale, and the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. He earned his many degrees from MIT, Harvard, and Columbia University, of course. In conversation with Mitchell, I'm happy to introduce Mary Mattingly. Mary is a bold visual artist with a strong commentary on the environment. She founded Swale, an edible landscape on a barge in New York City to circumvent public land laws, allowing anyone to pick free fresh food. Currently, Mary is artist in residence at the Brooklyn Public Library. And for more art, she's preparing to launch Public Water and a Year of Public Water, a multi-site public sculpture about New York City's drinking watershed. Her work has been exhibited in museums, including the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana, the Bronx Museum of the Arts, MoMA Education, the Brooklyn Museum, Storm King, the International Center of Photography, and the Palais de Tokyo. Mary's work has been featured in numerous books and leading art publications, and on BBC News, NPR, and Art 21. This is not your ordinary run-of-the-mill talk on rising environmental urgency. You will see that. And please watch it through as it deepens along the way. So now, let's begin. It's great to be here on Design Talks Now. I'm here with my good friend, colleague, and fellow uh, adventurer into ideas about the environment, uh, Mary Mattingly. I'm Mitch Joachim. I'm an architect and urban designer at Terraform One. We're a 501c3 in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and we work on problems that think about uh, extinction in our cities. So today we're gonna have a conversation between the two of us about what we can do, certainly post COVID, when it comes to issues of the environment, where arts make a difference, where technology will make some ideas of change, where our work, which is, I think, part activism, part social justice, part odd or weird science, part uh, autonomous worlds uh, kind of collides and where there's some contrast and, and what that means to the both of us. Because we, we have been working in a similar space for a decade or more at least. And I think there's, there's a lot in common. And I think now uh, th this crisis that so many of us are suffering through, this is a time where we can move off of just ideas and small projects to projects that have even more meaning and get us into civilization 2.0. 
because the United Nations has given us, what, eight years to stop climate change, to think about how all of the communities across the globe can play a part to, to, be a, to, to have an avid role in making change and not changing the weather, but changing the way our structures and our operations work, our economies operate, and certainly how design is, is certainly uh, working in those fields so that we make change for the better. The latest thing that Terraform One has been involved with, which is not just me, I'm uh, head of research, but Vivian Khan, who's our executive director, and Maria Ailova, who is our co-founder. We have been a part of putting all of this work into this massive volume. It's over 420 pages. It's on Actar, who's our publisher. They do all the great uh, uh, books that are out there for Harvard and other designers. We put together 14 years of projects that look at our cities, that look at the future of our neighborhoods and think about them through an environmental lens. Every project we work with uses some kind of a live organism, if not many types of, of organisms, to rethink those areas and cities. So the book is called Design with Life, From Biotech Architecture to Resilient Cities. And it's just chock full of, of kind of like a history of the projects that we have been developing, both at urban scale and all the way down to the molecular scale. We see these different points and we tease them out and we develop very structured narratives about the near future of our urban environments, especially when it comes to socio-ecological issues. And I'm gonna show some work because I think that everything we do is highly visual. This first project actually is a image of styrofoam and a bunch of really ugly, slightly yellow brown worms. And they're eating that styrofoam. And these are, these are mealworms, commonly found everywhere. The way mealworms carve out spaces and almost create their own structured and programmatic environments where they eat through the styrofoam, they absorb it into their bodies, their enzymes break it down and they poop it out into what's called frass. And their feces is actually pretty powerful uh, because it's got styrofoam that's moved through with a lot of those chemicals erased and cleansed using just their bodies in a completely organic process. Then they eat their own frass and it's cycled again through their enzyme structures. And then we have essentially compostable waste. They get rid of all of that e-waste. That's the stuff that, you know, your computers are shipped in, refrigerators, microwave ovens, speakers, any kind of styrofoam is really hard to recycle. And it's an amazing material from an industrial design perspective, but it's difficult to get rid of it. So here's a way that we produce these digesters which are meant to be in neighborhoods. They're meant to be uh, at a certain scale of thinking about waste streams in our cities. And these digesters are, are here on almost a ceremonious basis because we're doing the first ones in Camden, New Jersey, which has a lot of illegal dumping grounds. So we're putting one there. And folks bring their styrofoam, they dump it inside the system and the worms eat the styrofoam. So this shows you the actual uh, system in operation in Camden, New Jersey. So here is a massive styrofoam digester. So the, it's also got a, um, a very odd structure above it. And that's what we call a decomposition clock. Well, that's a clock made of mycelium that shows the length of time it takes for different materials with different embodied energy to be naturally decomposed in the environment. That's everything from aluminum to plastics would take millions of years, including styrofoam hundreds of thousands of years to get rid of it. So that clock represents the amount of time it would normally take to organically uh, discard this waste in the environment. Here, it's basically eaten by the worms, turned into compost, the worms turn into beetles, and then the rest of this structure is for birds to live in and around the structure and eat the beetles. So the whole thing is about this succession ecology or the system of cycling and getting rid of styrofoam. So why do all this? Why is Terraform One involved in that? Well, we're up against this incredible and horrific statistic, which is that all wildlife population on the planet is 50% less than it was since the 70s. Actually, some people think it's over 60% of every bird, mammal, coral, insect on this planet has disappeared forever because of human-based activities. We gotta stop this madness. Terraform has ramped up its game. We're not just an environmental architecture office. We are really working to stop extinction. This is a white rhino. There's only two of them left. My kids will never see white rhinos. They disappeared from the planet. The last of its kind 
is called an endling. So the creature you're looking at is an endling. Every seven minutes on this planet, we have another endling. Every seven minutes, we see another species extinct forever. That's what's happening. That's what the United Nations wants to stop. Designers can make a difference. This shows you the kind of the amount of uh, good we do in design, where we use different rating systems to stop the destruction of wildlife habitat, but not so much. It's mostly how we can green our buildings or the built environment or infrastructure in general. So if you look at all the different systems available, that's LEED, BREAM, Well Certification, Energy Star, Living Building Challenge, if you add them all up together, those numerics show that less than 5% of the points you get for doing good goes towards biodiversity. The world of developers aren't even incentivized to increase biodiversity because they don't get any points for it. That has got to change. If anything, I, I think you should get 100 points if you're just saving one creature from oblivion. So we call this design against extinction. That's the mission for Terraform One, and that really follows all the operations that's behind our work. Here is a creature that became our client for some time. It is a sentient being, just like us. It is a cricket. We're working to make this guy uh, live the happiest possible life imaginable till he dies naturally, and then we eat him as food. But not looking like that, we turn them into powder. Because we know Americans and Europeans, they don't eat any bugs, at least not willingly. We need to eat them because they're an alternate source of protein. Can't live off of cows, pigs, chicken, lamb, nonstop throwing this stuff down our throats and expecting to maintain the same kind of carrying capacity on this planet forever. Uh, we have already had massive implications on greenhouse gas emissions, water usage. It just doesn't work by consuming all of that meat. So here, cricket powder actually produces a massive savings. It's roughly around 2,000 gallons less water for the same ground protein and 300 times less greenhouse gas emissions. You a slide on the right shows that this is growing or producing crickets in cities. So it's the same 100 acres of land in Brooklyn, and those little pink dots are cricket farms producing the same exact amount of protein you get from 100 acres of land on the other side the left side of that uh, image, where it's produced in a rural region. And the efficiencies and everything you save is massive amounts of water and greenhouse gas emissions and certainly land. You go from pasture to plate directly. We designed this cricket shelter and farm where the crickets live really happy for six weeks of life. They live inside that system. When they die naturally, here you, you can see them inside the different pods. They're harvested by some people, so we use some human labor and they're ground into alternative protein sources. We work with Michelin-rated chefs to make the most flavorful foods you can imagine. We fed crickets food so they taste better for humans. These are actually devices or farms that can connect almost infinitely to one another so they can take up roof spaces in cities or other green spaces. Next slide shows a sectional condition that a lot of this is naturally ventilated. It comes out through these ports on the top. Those are actually instruments that magnify the sound of crickets. So you can hear the crickets singing and chirping because they're really happy and they're, they're looking for mates. We actually encourage mating a lot. So there's an area for um, spreading their genetics or propagating so that we have produced these pods for different mating activities. Right now it's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's going to the Walker next. But this is a, a project called the Urban Farm Pod, the Plug in Ecology Project. It's a rotegrity sphere, flat packed and then assembled on site like a piece of Ikea furniture. They could be almost any size from 18 feet in diameter to something small like four feet in diameter. It's a farm. It's a farm for urban spaces where you grow your own food locally so that you have some kind of accountability for the stuff that you eat and where your food comes from. It's not a green wall, it's a green ball. So it's three times the amount of surface area, it's super compact. It could be on balconies, rooftops, urban parks, inside your apartment, et cetera. It can grow food on the exterior, all around the exterior. It's got nine columns of sub-irrigation that trickles water down into all the pots and ends up in a cistern at the base. And then you can also grow food on the inside. You can actually occupy it as part cabin, part farm. We're also growing food from test tubes. This is very much about design against extinction. It's saving a beautiful charismatic creature from oblivion that's native to New York. 
It's called the monarch butterfly. And these guys are dying at the rate of something like 90 million in the last few years. The US Fish and Wildlife Services are saying that we might lose them all forever. Mostly that's due to their habitat disappearing. They need milkweed. So we designed a building that includes a sanctuary for monarchs in the skin of the building and onto the rooftop and into the back. And it's a porous skin so the butterflies can come in and out. It's a sanctuary for them to have some moment of safety and propagation, but they're meant to rewild the streets of New York. We designed something to tack onto any building surface that's modular, that's at scale, that has a known cost per square footage that can take care of almost any creature and build up increased biodiversity in our cities. That was the goal. So this system has been patented for Terraform to do it with many different types of things. So there's the sanctuary, it goes up to the rooftop garden, which is a pollinator garden and an education center. And then it goes into the back where there's a courtyard space and an atrium space, all leftover poche space that instead of just is there for piping and for running your internet cables, it's now running uh, areas for butterflies to live survive and thrive. So we've got large scale LED screens. So people in the neighborhood can see that activity from far away and they'll get closer and they'll see the whole building is filled with butterflies. This building is actually in Nolita, right down from Prada near Soho in New York. So uh, it's in a really prominent location. How do we run this operation? Well, we've got artificial drones actually service the outside of the building and let us know about population count, air quality, uh, the amount of milkweed that's available, some of the butterfly feeders we designed for the American Museum of Natural History. We do large-scale 3D printing after we find out what butterflies like when it comes to living on walls and what that means, and then designing systems that eventually get reproduced and turned into building modules. The actual installation of this project at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian, those are live monarchs inside that space, perching and enjoying those zones. When you look out the window of this building, you see this biodiversity garden filled with butterflies as you look out into the street. So it's a great relationship between humans and this charismatic organism. I definitely want to see Mary's work, and I then want to talk about it with her, about the things that we've been up to when it comes to climate dynamics and designing with the environment. Yeah, thanks, Mitch. Um, and thanks for having me be part of this Design Talks Now series. My background is as an independent artist. I believe that art is born from personal experience. And, and my personal experience really is uh, about growing up in an agricultural town that was constantly battling for clean drinking water with levels of the chemical DDT still sort of climbing throughout the 1980s when it was banned in the 70s. Um, so I think witnessing more and more people getting sick in the place that I grew up made me think about the work that I was going to do as a duty towards reinforcing clean water as a human right. And Mitch and I had met on um, this project called The Water Pot in 2009 that was a barge-based ecosystem where four people, including myself, lived and worked for six months. We made everything that we sort of needed to live off of, and it was a public space. That got me thinking about New York City's waterway. So in 2016, was able to collaboratively launch this project called Swale. Swale is the name of a floating food forest on a barge that I led and I co-built with intrepid partners citywide. So it docked at numerous piers in New York and adjacent to New York City's public lands on the Bronx River. It began in 2016, it went through 2019 with the possibility of coming back to the Brooklyn Army Terminal. So it was permitted as a public artwork, but it used the common laws of the water as a loophole to do what was illegal on public land. So Swale was a public platform where anyone could pick fresh foods for free an illegal public act when committed on public land in a largely privatized city. And this came about after getting to know lots of people working in the community garden world, which right now in New York City is 100 acres compared to 30,000 acres of public parkland. People who were and still are fighting for that space in the face of real estate that's eager to take it over as soon as it's reached a certain value. And with the help of Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice, Swale docked on the Bronx River, which is adjacent to Concrete Plant Park. There it acted as a calculated catalyst for what could happen in public parkland. So the city is really concerned with over-harvesting, about people also inadvertently eating the wrong part of a plant that could make a person sick. I think at its heart, Swale was really a call to action. It asked us to reconsider food systems in the city in order to grow some of what 
we're now dependent on international supply chains for. In 2018, New York City, at least in part, backtracked on its foraging law and launched its first foodway in Concrete Plant Park in the Bronx. And the foodway is a place where anyone can come 24 hours a day to pick fresh foods for free. I think most of the work that I do involves transforming industrial equipment into sculptural ecosystems or into habitats. It's bringing together individuals and groups with diverse skill sets in the communities where the sculptures are invited to be. So we organize around reimagining public food, also reinforcing access to clean drinking water and co-building with discarded materials. I think about sculpture in a few different ways, but they're always durational. So they always unfold through these performative gestures. And this is an image of this sculpture called Pole, being pulled from the Parque Central in Havana to the Museo Nacional de Bellas Artes, where it was set up as a self-sufficient ecosystem um, that was sort of like an aquaponic system where uh, water would cycle through it, feed fish, and also feed some birds and then continue to uh, allow these plants to grow. Another way I think about durational sculpture, so this plays out uh, through maybe a personal experience with it, and this is called Wading Bridge, and it functions as a proposal for a more watery future. This is in Des Moines, Iowa, in the Raccoon River, a place where there's lots of flooding, agricultural runoff. People would generally say that they would avoid this river, that they were almost afraid of this river. So crossing Wading Bridge, even though it was only allowed to span 16 feet <laughs> um, underwater, six inches, and getting your feet wet could allow this maybe momentary intimacy with a, this river that you really didn't want to spend that much time in. So for me, this project and projects like it are ways to value both perceptual and physical experience. Triple Island, this happened on Pier 42 in Lower Manhattan. It's made from scrap, like most of the projects that I do are. And in a public art context, I think sculpture can be effective at serving dual functions. So here, Triple Island was part of an ecosystem, but also part action to halt a condo development on a vacant Manhattan pier. Unintended at first, we were brought in to do this project by an umbrella group called Paths to Pier 42. Here, Instances of temporary public art alone can't make as much difference as they can together. And everyone who took part in this project was part of something much bigger than their individual works. This is a project called Wetland. It happened in 2014 and it was made entirely from scrap. And one question that drives me is what happens when we can transform objects and materials with past histories together in order to tell complex stories? Um, so Wetland represented this sinking house where on board we were sharing DIY water purification systems, remediation system. Uh, we had clear wall for bees uh, that would provide us honey. And I lived on here and so did some other friends and people who decided they would do artists or writers residencies on here. The bottom floor functioned as a theater and the top was where we stayed. So this, this is a personal project. And I think it, it came out of spending six months living on the water pod and then in six weeks living on wetland. Um, as well as Triple Island, I think, living on these ecological art projects that all had no space for trash, right? Um, always asked me to reconsider the surroundings that I would come back to in daily life. I wanted to figure out um, the objects that I had in my own life. I wanted to think about the city's collective monument of the landfill, um, to reconsider my own collection of objects and think of them as monuments to my own consumption. So a few years ago, in 2013, I bundled almost everything that I had in my possession and pulled the bundles through New York City to emphasize the weight of the objects, where they were mined, produced, how they were distributed around the world. Um, in the town that I grew up in, not only was the water polluted, but when the food uh, that was produced went into the city, the garbage always came back out. So I think in the back of my mind, localizing production, distribution, and expulsion is something that I really believe is necessary for a post-extraction future. So there are two other projects, but they're kind of long. One is Public Water, um, one is Ecotopian Library. It's based on this idea that art, geoscience, and ecotopian thought can cultivate eco-social change. So it's a platform for other people's powerful work and important ideas. It's been a way to help me think about what happens after, what comes next. Mary, the, the work that you do is phenomenal. And I'm really glad that uh, Eileen Shaw and Design Talks Now has brought us together 
you know, we, we think that waste needs to go away and that's, that's nothing new. I mean, clearly your projects are highlighting that in so many different ways, whether it's on a personal level where you're, you're kind of confronting the amount of, you know, stuff that you throw out to just your entire self-reliant systems that are about producing food and, and energy and then dealing with the waste in a, in a, some kind of a cycle. They're, 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 they're important experiments but we're nowhere near getting them off the ground as far as every American participating in this kind of post-extraction world or post-extinction world. It's almost like I, I want to ask you, what, what happens if you know, the next president comes along, whoever that might be, uh, and they, they put you in charge at the cabinet level of doing these projects uh, at an enormous scale, the scale of regions in the United States? And what and how would we even roll that out? And, and would we achieve the impacts that we're looking for? Is it even enough? It's, we're worried about other things. Uh, right now it's COVID. And, and, and that might be helpful because it's the crisis that we've been talking about all along. So if we are one biology, can we recognize that we're one ecosystem and that that's the next thing to hit us? And if we don't do something about it, shame on us. What kind of a soapbox do we need to stand on to almost get people to wake up and 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 stop the madness. On Swale, uh, when we were ch when we were trying to figure out why the Parks Department was um, not allowing foraging in parks to happen, uh, it came out that you know they would allow it in different parks, but there has to be a stewardship group in that park that really wants to help care for it with the Parks Department, and then it will happen. Um, and it just made me think, oh yeah, this is like that. That is how this this change can happen. It happens on a small scale with committed individuals all over the place. Yeah, well, you said it early on, you brought up the idea of maintenance, whether it's citizen science, whether it's like uh, dealing with what, where these waste streams goes, where it's how do you clean the solar cells to, uh, you know, everything that's happening on swale. You know, we looked at drones or quad rotors uh, to some level of service. We were doing another project with ODA in Los Angeles, doing a sanctuary for monarchs there. And that, that's the giant question that everyone's asking is mostly the maintenance and the cost of the maintenance. You mentioned Buckminster Fuller, obviously a big influence on, you know, the, the works that we both do. You know, Bucky had a maintenance plan. I mean, it, you know, the manual for spaceship Earth is a part of that. The Dymaxion grid is a part of that. That's, I mean, it was, he didn't directly, I think, refer to it as maintenance, but he was definitely thinking about uh, how we maintain, uh, you know, this kind of relationship to the Earth's metabolism and how crucial that is. It's almost as if, you know, he wanted us to be, uh, you know, have, have a kind of an endless source of energy and to be carefree in the things that we were learning and the pursuits of life. And that the, the, the everything else that we needed, shelter and food and, and, and uh, you know, air quality or movement, mobility of any kind, that was all pre-solved and not really a kind of a struggle in our day to day. It was just kind of running as it should, like at enormous capacity and incredibly optimized. And we don't think about it. We just go from place to place, use all the energy we want, have access to food and shelter, and not worry about those things. Instead, worry about what makes us better as humans. That we kind of we strive to be a, a greater, you know, a greater kind of being with a, an incredible sense of interdependency and links to our histories and our cultures and a projection into our future. The best thing maybe about maintenance, I guess, from a Bucky perspective is, is to make it this kind of successful undergrid that's just everywhere, but, not, but it uh, is really invisible. Or, or if it is visible, it's, it's to the point where we, we're so excited by it as a spectacle and it works so well, um, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, and like you said earlier, some things are, are for the example and some things are for the platform um, and other things, like you're saying now, are, are the undercurrent. And yeah, that's, that's been part of, I guess, the way cities have been working. It's been really unique to be working on the water because you get to see a lot of that infrastructure happen and something that I was never really aware of on land. But all of the maintenance that it takes just to keep the city floating is really apparent or just to keep it dry, right? Like the subways being pumped out all the time. Um, yeah, combined sewage overflow, CSO. What cities have done when it comes to those boundary conditions between water and human programmatic space between our occupied land, as, especially in New York, has almost been none. 
I mean, we are expecting another flood to come, another Hurricane Sandy. That's definite. Yeah. We've had projects on the boards forever. I know Terraform, we won a, uh, an AIA uh, award for some of the research we were doing on flooding and flood management before Hurricane Sandy, and we're not the only ones. But it came, it devastated New York, and we, ha we have not done anything since. It's been seven, eight years, I'm, I'm losing count, since Hurricane Sandy, and we've had something like $40 billion devoted in the tri-state area to stop uh, uh, future water and flooding issues, and we we have done we've done next to nothing. First, there's the wall that may or may not still happen. It sounds like it's it won't happen, and then the wetlands, the wetland restoration, which is what you guys were working yeah. on, right? right? And, yeah. and so that's been happening, but it's like happening far enough off offshore that it won't um, protect most of the city still, and it's just one of those mitigation fronts. You know, part of it is there's there's money. There's the, the lap, you know, how it'll trap the water up the Hudson and in the East River that we need to move through it because of the animals who live there, because of the pollutants that get trapped in there. Um, so you're thinking about like essentially creating this dead zone right in, in lower Manhattan for the water. Um, you're also probably contending with um, unions who need to have that waterway accessible for, um, for jobs, right? And then then there's the Port of New York, New Jersey, which would be impacted. And I don't know, it's just, yeah, there's so many issues tied up into one thing. That great shift that you're talking about is going to be really difficult to see. I think about Donella Meadows, the system scientist, and she has this, this quote about the widening wealth disparity where she says there will there'll always be someone who can afford to eat the last fish and someone who will need to catch it um, as the wealth disparity widens, right? It's impossible to think of uh, about doing the, these larger infrastructure changes until that's solved. There, there's so much effort to create change on every possible front in, in society. I mean, the, the, the arguments there are very real, uh, especially the ones about systemic racism. I mean, how, how do you choose that over climate change? You, you can't. Uh, which one is more important? I don't know. Which one goes first? I, they should go together. Uh, that's why a lot of the new discussion in, uh, in you know the environmental debate is is social justice based you know or justice based environmentalism, which is seen to have a lot of equality because the people that are going to be affected by flooding and the first ones that are going to not have access to fresh water or the right food sources or have uh, shelters are going to be most likely the the, the poor. Yeah. Uh, and, and they're going to be in communities that are most susceptible to uh, climate, climate problems. So, so it does make a lot of sense that, that uh, those two issues are hand in hand. The work we do, we call it socio-ecological design. We've given up the idea that this is about the science and the engineering only. It's, it's not. It's, it's the capricious public. It's our leadership class or our, our diplomat. And it's certainly the public at large. Um, that, that is incorporated in those designs. You know, who is going to maybe solve some of these issues of climate change and racial injustice and get to civilization 2.0 faster than the rest of us? And who could lead by example? Who understands kind of ideas about a resilient economy or a regenerative system that becomes part of their infrastructure when it comes to food, waste, water, energy, air quality, transportation? Like, who is going to get there first? I, I, I don't know per se, I mean, but if I was to guess, might be New Zealand, I'll give them a, a, a shout out. Uh, they seem to, because they're on an island and they uh, realize that they are always kind of cut off from the rest of the world, they're still modern and sophisticated, but they've dealt with many of the infrastructural issues internally. They're very self-sufficient. They understand the limits of their economy. They're almost in a kind of a steady state system. So, so I, I think maybe there's something there. There's also these smaller experiments like Mazdar, which is something that's in uh, you know, the Middle East, uh, done by Foster, and is, it hasn't been a, a success since, but at least doing uh, experiments at the scale of cities that look at self-sufficiency, that look at the just the absolutely new way of producing how we live at scale, thinking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of homes, uh, large scale populations and doing it where it's all completely sourced from renewable energy. 
Like that is something that's pretty fantastic. And Europa is another project. Ram Kulas is leading that and a few others. But thinking of energy systems that are shared between Africa and Europe, where solar power is captured in places like Egypt or you know, outside Fez or Northern Africa, and then is traded to places like uh, Scandinavia, which gets it when the world is, is uh, you know, it's nighttime and they'll trade wind energy or wave energy back to Africa. So this massive transfer scheme between energy systems between countries could happen. So the N Europa version is, uh, uh, or ideal has is, is been out there. And I also think that it's not just utopias or smaller experiments or isolated areas or islands or whatever. I think that Brooklyn has a chance of getting it right. I mean, this is a place where 300 plus, what, 308 languages are spoken here. It's a rainbow of different income classes and peoples from all over the planet. We've got a massive creative class, like the largest creative class on earth. Brooklyn would be the chance where we fight for racial justice, where we fight for environmental change where we fight to get closer to a better place because it's it's got to be it's got to get it's got to be in an existing system it's got to be in a real melting pot that we make those changes and it's this is the hardest place to do it but but i think it's i think it's, it's got to happen in real time inside an actual context it, it doesn't work if it's an experimental petri dish outside of that system so here's new york we're confronting it now in 2020. Like this is the time where we can at least lay the groundwork for that future scenario where we get some of these things solved. That's awesome. I'll just add to that, that I think we're, we are seeing that with mutual aid networks uh, right now. And I think that really the, these uh, decentralized, um, ex like smaller scale um, situations that do exist everywhere, it's just not the main narrative. And I think um, maybe that's what we were getting at in the conversation too was like how do you not only how do you change the narrative to make maintenance like really appreciated but how do you also how do you also push um, some stories forward that um, can you know push that type of, of mutual aid to a to a level that most people can see or more people can see and I think that's that it's it's there but it's hidden the underground economy right mm -hmm. something that's that sort of everyone depends on in some way, um, but it's not the main narrative. Greta Thunberg, I mean, she's, she's trying to create that narrative at scale. Um, you know, and, and her argument is that it's, it's really about intergenerational tyranny. It's, it's not her fault that she inherited this world the way it is, all screwed up, especially in the environment. And it's not the fault of all the young people. They just don't want to accept it. So maybe it's, it's not exactly a where, but it's a who question. And the who would be, you know, this, this up and coming generation that just does not want to take it. Maybe they're just, they're, they can stop playing some video games for a little bit, but they can uh, then get on board with uh, global transformation. Like at some point, I think they might be the generation that gets it right uh, because we've been the generation fighting it as a bridge for a long time from the previous generations and we inherited it but we didn't quite solve it yet so I, i'd like to see the youth uh who can't stand it anymore just absolutely just in a, a kind of sheer force of rage demand change demand it from the, our leaders across the globe they have ideas of what the change could be there's libraries filled with you know all types of inventions to think about you know energy transformation or or uh, mobility transformation, or, or or new new ways of, of how we use our water or produce food. That's not that's not new. It's how they get deployed and the willingness of a of a grand public to get it um, deployed. That's that does need to be there. It's it's not easy to produce those solutions because there there's so many different variables. But it, it's heterodoxic thinking. Yeah. But true thinking about let's let's go. Doesn't matter what scale or scope. We've got to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, so it's, it's not just mm -hmm. human diversity, it's biodiversity and back and forth. And, um, you know, I think, I'll, you know, I'll bring up Arnes, Arnie Ness, uh, the mm -hmm. region philosopher. Uh, you know, he was fantastic in his ideas of deep ecology. And, and one of the things he brought up, among, actually two of them that were actually really important, but the first one was everything needs an identification. A stone, some mud, 
a bird, everything that you see in the ecosystem, wheat, what it doesn't matter, and certainly humans and our objects and our us as peoples. Having identity is important because many of the things that we talk about doesn't really have a knowable uh, uh, identity. That's not really declared as something equal to something else. And the second thing he said is that you can diagram that rather easily. So instead of the traditional diagram we think of when, we, when it comes to the human race, we've got men on top, not women, unfortunately. It's supposed to be men and women, but men on top. And then we have this hierarchy of everything underneath us, which is whales and dolphins and then horses and then wolves and predators. And then eventually on the bottom is worms and fungus and viruses. And it's this terrible pyramid and it's absurd. Every single part of that system is necessary for everything else and does need to be identified. So he reorients that diagram where it's just this kind of circle, a circle of life where humans are in it and we're just a part of it next to dolphins, next to fungus. And it's just one kind of you know, uh, mixed condition, fully mixed, a web of life. Again, that's a philosophical approach that comes from our, our educational models, from our financial models. It's just... Yeah, I mean, I think the the real, the revolutionary stuff that you guys are doing really has to do with food and animal rights and the crickets, I think is so important. And like you said, it's something that's addressing land use, it's addressing pollution, climate change, um, animal rights. Um, I mean, how far, I'm curious to know how far it goes or what your, what your vision is for. Basically all organisms are sentient, especially uh, hidden life of trees. Uh, I mean, that's a yeah. great book to come out with the narrative of that, but oh, there, there's been uh, plant neurobiologists for years saying that plants were truly sentient thinking, logical beings, and that they don't, uh, that the physicalists say they don't, they don't have like a little organelle inside there that we can recognize as a brain or a mind. And for a long time, plants were thought to not have those things. But what they have figured in, in, in through a lot of studies, uh, definitely in that book uh, and others, is that they're actually connected underground to an incredible neural net that is a thinking system. It's the mycelium linking to the roots of, of trees, talking to other trees. And if you zoom out, you finally see the mind of trees is at the scale of a forest. We just couldn't, we were thinking at the scale of a plant, like little acorn brain, and that's how, it's not true. Their brain is landscape sized. Their brain is very real. It has memory, it has history, it, 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 it talks, it's sending real electrical signals, just like our neural net inside our own heads. And that we don't understand the language. We don't know exactly what they're saying. We have ideas about protection and safety and soil acidity and precipitation and rainfall, the basic stuff, but we, have, we don't know what they're saying. If I was a tree, I'd be saying, can we get rid of some of these humans? It's a recognition that, uh, that, that all of these things are sentient. And I don't mean that in any spiritual sense. I'm sorry, I'm completely agnostic to, to assigning a spirituality to it. It's, to me, it's really a matter of, 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 uh, uh, of science in this case, or at least uh, uh, provable factual information that we need to operate on mostly to kind of save ourselves from oblivion. We're headed towards that extinction. So the earth's not going to care. Uh, just it'll live another, you know, hundred million years without us just fine. It'll just shrug its shoulders and we disappear. We're just, we're so brand new. I mean, it's crazy. Socrates, I mean, ancient Greece is 2,500 years. That is it. Yeah, we're, it's nothing compared to how long, I mean, there, there are tree species that have been around for 6,000 years, 6, 10,000 years old, trees on Earth, right? On now. Earth, I know, still, still living. Yeah, I, I think, okay, well, here's something that I often say, and this comes from Paul Gilding and a few others, uh, but I think what's going to happen is there'll be a giant ugly crisis, and if COVID wasn't it, wow, shame on us, but there will be a giant crisis in the climate, and that will have what? We'll, we'll retool our civilization within one or two years. We did it when America was confronted by Pearl Harbor. What we did to Japanese Americans, not good. But we did retool our entire economy to be in the war effort, get rid of those Nazis, fight off our enemy, I guess in this case with Japan at the time, and, and, uh, and have a complete realignment of how we make things and manufacture things, 
what the, the amount of food that we eat, the kind of careful maintenance of our general use of resources, period, was all highly refined and controlled. And Congress wasn't arguing anymore. They just got right to the job. They really went to solve the problem. That's because we had a common enemy. So if we see something that's, that's much more clear than just a, a small temperature change or carbon in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million or acidity levels in the ocean, wiping out coral reefs, you know, bleaching reefs, like something that we, we see as tangibly dangerous, mm. I, think we can get our, I think we can get our act together and do it quickly I just don't know if it's if it's maybe too late, especially since like the 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 the, the, thing, the changes that have happened now under COVID, the, the kind of the, the the no airplanes flying and this kind of great sort of you know uh, pre-industrial return that we're seeing with a lot of you know effects on the atmosphere, mm -hmm. it, it won't take effect until 20 years from today actually won't have any consequence for 20 something years. And the effects we feel today are 20 years old from what we were doing back then. We just, I didn't realize there was that much of a delay. Wow, that's really interesting. Hell yeah, that's, it's a 20 year delay. We talk about predatory delay at Terraform and um, this is also very real. It's the people, let's say in, in gas and oil, just pick up that industry as one of the folks that actually say publicly, we love your ideas. And the thought is, is that, well, they don't want the whole world being self-reliant because every single day they're in business is billions of dollars of profit. So it doesn't hurt from a PR standpoint to agree with a lot of the environmental issues, but just they, they don't want it to happen now. They want us to slow down the system. That's predatory delay. Just keep it going, but at a very slow rate because there really isn't to them the big emergency. It's hard for us to point that out. And that's what we're confronting is sort of nice people yeah. on, in the, the foreground, you know, the PR folks, the, the, the marketing people, uh, but it's not the insidious machine behind it that is already corrupted this planet. And, and they didn't mean to be that way to their, you know, much to their credit didn't start off that way. We realized it in the, the mid fifties. So it's been a difficult conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's like an exponential a system that's exponentially um, you know, needs more and more, needs to keep eating more and more and in order to thrive. And yeah, I think about, you know, climate change is one of those problems that's really too big to comprehend maybe, or to justly comprehend. And it's sort of like, you know, I've been doing that research on the high seas and that seems to be the issue with the high seas as a commons versus smaller commons that can be maintained or taken care of by, by people who know each other and trust each other and work together and caring for a place. The high seas is a, is a place where it just it's just too big to to monitor well, right? It's and and with that disparity and with and with people's a lot of people's like the, our government's you know first ad, agenda point is the economy. Then you have that disparity and where where um, you know where other countries are like fighting for survival. Then you have that disparity and a place that had this like enormous ideal right or this utopian ideal of uh, this place where everybody could manage it and everybody could have could be part of the high seas right it doesn't belong to anyone sort of like the atmosphere it's similar when you're thinking of climate change it's like it's it's everybody's it's everybody's space it should be everybody's responsibility and then it becomes too big and i don't it's it's a difficult quandary. And then of course the seasteaders, which is you know the Silicon Valley optimists and the, and yeah. the billionaire class that want to occupy the high seas with these these enclaves for um, you know technologists and the super wealthy. Um, we've been seeing more of that, and those are utopias thought of from Buckminster Fuller and before. The earlier days of Terraform, we were looking at um, these impossible places uh, that were in the middle of the ocean. Where, where no one laid any kind of claim to them. And there was uh, a project by Darwin and the British Royal Navy and, and his vessel, the Beagle. Uh, oh, where he, it was called, yeah, it's called uh, Ascension Island. And it's a very real island that was a complete, you know, naked rock with nothing on it. And Darwin said, you know, we can terraform this. We can actually create a, a habitable ecosystem, a biotope from scratch. 
And he did, he brought over loam and soil and different pine trees and all types of vegetables and plants. And he planted them on this kind of naked surface of rock. And they actually took hold. They took wow. hold after you know 10 years and they formed their own microclimate around it. The whole Krebs cycle started again and, and, they, and he jumped jump-started this, this uh, island to life in the middle of nowhere. And it's, it's great, you can see that kind of experimentation. I'm also like, a, you know, I'm a big fan of the Elon Musk approach, which is, you know, he, he's doing environmental work, but he doesn't say that. Instead, he makes a big, sexy electric car that costs a lot of money and gets everyone with their, their traditional value systems of sexy cars to buy into it. And people find that it's, it's exciting and it's amazing and, oh yeah, just, in a very stealth way, it happens to be green because it runs on electric battery, has no moving parts. And then he produced the Giga plant that uh, makes those kinds of batteries. And so, so, so Elon Musk has been very good at, at, um, at, at selling these things because they're, they're super exciting and they're, they fit into that consumer mentality that we've been trained on since, you know, I don't know. Do you think we can get out of the, that mentality? Because I think it's, I think that, that project is really exciting of, of uh, making these super sleek, slick cars uh, that obviously depend on like mo mega mining all over the world and potentially even in the oceans. And, um, you know, I don't know, like if you're doing a cost benefit analysis on them, I'm not really sure uh, how they pan out. Although I, I'm like trained to think that Elon Musk's car is like much, much more green, but yeah. But I guess I'm wondering if that's the, if that's the only alternative or if like Elon Musk made that, that car super sexy and sort of sold us the green um, behind the curtain, can we do that with maintenance? The consumer society that we've developed is incredibly wrong and backwards. It's absurd. Uh, you know, uh, Stuart Brand recognized that with the whole earth catalog. There's, I mean, a million people that can point that out. We design things for obsolescence. That's everything. Like it's either perceived obsolescence or actual mechanical functional obsolescence. So you buy a toaster, it's only supposed to last a few years before something in it breaks and you got to buy another one. That's the whole point of our economy is to constantly keep us out there shopping and shopping is equal to happiness and happiness is shopping. And you're being told what shoes you need to wear that the latest iPhone, even though this thing works perfectly well as an iPhone 10, I'm not going to buy another iPhone for five more years. And I might be very upset if they don't give me a battery because I know <laughs> mine to uh, fail. Thank you, Apple. But we, we've got to use objects that last forever. We've got to design objects that last forever. That is an imperative, period. We need toothbrushes that are family heirlooms. Got to make it yeah. so goddamn good. You never want to throw it out. And it's your grandpa's toothbrush. And it's fantastic. Might replace the bristles, the stuff that actually goes away. But the rest of it is here forever. And I think we need a new type of micro manufacturing economy where people actually build and make things themselves, like in a village, not an industrial sense, but a village where you go and you know that's the blacksmith or you know that's the a, a seamstress or you know that's whatever the cobbler did, I don't, or a baker, like, and it's all local. And you take pride in the things that you make and you don't make zillions of them. You make few of them and you make them really well and they last for forever and they're more expensive, but people don't have to go out and buy stuff all the time. We got to get away from this Keynesian mentality of constantly consuming and tossing out, and consuming and tossing out. We can do it. Harley Davidson is an example of a, a company that, Everyone who works for Harley Davidson loves their job. They make amazing motorcycles. They cost a fortune. Everyone loves them. They're great. I, well, I don't like them, but most Americans do. I think they're fine. But uh, you know, imagine if we didn't have Nike sneakers made someplace in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. They're made. There are few of them made here, and they're crafted by people that you know who love their job, making the coolest possible sneakers you can imagine with wicked styles. And it costs a lot of money to buy them, like a thousand dollar or a fifteen hundred dollar pair of sneakers, and you never throw it out. You keep it for freaking fifty years. You might replace some parts as they wear away, but you always have a pride in the thing that you owned because there was a pride in the thing that was. There's pride used in the thing that was made. That's a different kind of America. It's it's actually an older way, but it's yeah. it's a more circuitous version. I think one thing that we both do that you're making me think about is like regenerative design where we depend on the on the organisms to do the work after we sort of put it into play. And I think that that's 
like making ecosystems is really exciting because you really never know what's going to happen next because it's not up to you. Um, and I think about that with that Fab Treehab project that you guys have, uh, where you know over the course of ten years you're growing this tree and the tree, then you're forming the tree into a house, right? And then you can have this whole field of potential houses that sort of um, graft graph together over time, and they make themselves, right? So all you do, you start with the the land and the seed, and maybe the companion plants, and then you sort of let it go and train them. And I think that that like, that's a, also a really exciting way to think about consumption and working together maybe i don't know what that is. i think it's regenerative uh it is definitely regenerative design and resilient design uh you know that early influence of that was uh dr john todd and nancy jack todd who wrote eco cities to living machines uh, one of the statements in there is to take a piece of nature as it is without any modification and sort of nudge it or tweak it for some use uh, and that was we just use what plants do what do plants do naturally all the time in jungles or in forests and we tweak it to shape a geometry that becomes a home we just allow it to grow in a way that it normally would grow if it was exposed to just the right sort of incline or gravity and then it, it forms a shape that we can reuse and we graft it because it naturally would graft when it encounters other plants and we, we create these these, these structures have been thinking about growing woody plants to precise geometries with computer-driven scaffolds where they form these, these really tight, beautiful vascular systems where homes and landscape be, are indistinguishable. There's no difference between the house and the landscape and it welcomes all kinds of creatures or biodiversity on its back and its front and it's 100% it's a part of the land. And it's, it's just actually using technologies that have been around for some time, not the computer driven ones, but ideas about grafting that happen in gardening has been around for thousands of years. We're doing this in upstate New York near Storm King. That is a truly regenerative system. It's not housing as we know it today. And I'm kind of sick of concrete, glass and steel I think it's had its century. Thank you. We're done on some level. And now we need, we need, to, we need to think about a bio-based economy, economy that's totally designed with biology in, in mind directly. And I, I think that uh, that's changing everything. To me, some of the most exciting work in, in, in art and, and in most of these, these kinds of fields. I think that, that honestly, Fab Tree Hub is one of the most exciting projects that I've heard about. Um, and I think about it a lot. And I was really interested in following what the Forest Service was doing with assisted plant migration. With climate change, I know that they're looking at, um, you know, trees that were alive at one point during the Eocene in a certain place and thinking about planting them now in order to maybe affect what forests could be growing with extreme climate change. So they're looking at, you know, what grew in the past in a place, in the, in the deep time past, and thinking about how that could affect um, you know, 100 years from now or 50 years from now. And, and I think that like, depending on the, yeah, I can, I can completely vision that world where there are these trees that are, are your home. No, no, we, <laughs> see, my brain is jumping to uh, James Cameron in Avatar. It's, a, it's an interesting paradigm, very fictive. It didn't promise that we'd get there, but electrical impulses of trees, humans talking to trees, you know, hundred thousand year old trees where we're all living inside them. It, it is a, it is a, a, a brilliant fantasy it might be slightly escapist, but it, it's not, it really just brings up the question of utopia. And a lot of people, especially in academia, don't want to discuss it. They think that utopia is not a worthy topic. I mean, maybe dystopia or the problems we see with those things, but I think it's an amazing research agenda, especially the materials inside it and the kind of the, you know, the long-term engagement you'd have with those materials, like you were saying with, with old growth forests or trees or things that are, have been around since, you know, a million years before humankind. But every culture on this planet, pretty much since the dawn of time, is desired to get to a better place. I mean, that's yeah. part of humans. So utopia has always been the question. And it doesn't mean perfect place. It just means good place. Right now we're we're in a we're not in a good place, and I, I think that striving together as a community, as a, a world community, recognizing that we've got to get to a good place. That's um, there's there's people doing that work, the United Nations and beyond. We better get there sooner. That's that's about it, and and yeah. in part it's uh, 
it's 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 writing that mission on what what happens first to get us there. I see that response to to utopianism as like being very very negative, especially recently. But I completely believe in it, and I believe that if the dial is not pushed as far as possible towards something that could be utopian for someone, or if we don't do that work of of pushing forward towards those more ideal ways of living, more just ways of living, then um, the dial will be pushed in the other direction much further. So I, I think utopia is also no place, right? It's like you can almost never get there, but it's not about getting there, but it's about getting as as far away from dystopia as you can. And I don't think there's a savior model in something like yeah. this. I don't think there's a silver bullet. We actually like to use a terraform, we call it silver buckshot. But we just spread out a bunch of little silver bullets and then, you know, it'll, it'll eventually solve some problems. I definitely want to thank uh, give a big thanks to Eileen Shaw and to be a part of Design Talks Now. It was just a really important initiative that the city of New York is a part of. And just it's great to have a conversation with you, Mary. And the work that you're doing is fantastic. And it, it's actually an honor to have this conversation. And I think we're going to ramp up the game uh, as soon as this, this pandemic's over with. Well, it sounds like a deal. Thanks, Eileen. And thanks, Mitch. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mitchell and Mary, for your brilliant and caring work. And thank you all for joining us. Let's wake up and stop the madness. Let's think about what dystopia means to us and seize the moment. Design Talks Now will keep the conversations going through July. We're interested in what's on your mind and what matters to you now. So please stay safe, stay smart, Design stands together.